share on what Jubilee is. What is Jubilee? And I realize at this particular location, you're the furthest away, and so many of you will not be able to participate in person, but you'll hear about Jubilee throughout the year. Those that are new coming into the body, they don't really know what Jubilee is. So it's important that we stop and we, we explain why we do what we do and that we understand everything has a purpose and that we need to be renewed in that purpose. And so Jubilee is very special to our church and it's a sanctified week and it's not just a conference. It's not another conference. It certainly isn't what I come up under camp meeting, but it is a very special sanctified time. And I specifically got a rhema word from the Lord over 35 years ago on setting aside a week. And he gave me two illustrations. I'll cover them next week uh, as we assemble together um, in that session but he gave me the example of the 10 lepers and how that only one came back and gave thanks and which, which leper are we gonna be? And I wanna be the one that comes back and says, thank you for everything you've done in my family this year, for everything you've done in our church this year, everything in your lives. And so the second one was the offering of Isaac where the offering of Isaac as a type of Christ is shown in the life of Abraham and some specific things God gave us instruction in. And so we're seeing not only Jubilee after all these decades have such a profound impact on us, we're seeing other churches truly get a vision of this. And so we need to start making plans to not only celebrate what God's done in Victory Life, but what God has done in other churches that are connected to us. And so it's expanding even more. So what is Jubilee? Let's go to Luke chapter four, and this is where Jesus introduces the concept of an Old Testament celebration every 50th year, he brings it over into the new covenant. And so he's already been preaching and, and sharing in the synagogues and now he goes to his own hometown. And how many of you know it's always different when you share in your own hometown. Amen. Somebody asked me one time, what is a big shot? A big shot is a little shot away from home. <laughs> that's, what, that's what a big shot is. So now he's come home to his own hometown and verse 16 says of Luke four, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to set at liberty those that are oppressed to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Everyone there knew what the acceptable year of the Lord was. That was a direct reference to the 50th year that they had celebrated in their history that was called Jubilee. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Man, I don't know if you can feel that, but that would have been one church service I was glad I didn't miss. Amen. Amen. Today, not tomorrow, not another decade, not another 50 years from now, the thing they were accustomed to hearing, now he says, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. The Passion Translation says of verse 19, I have come to share the message of Jubilee for the time of God's great acceptance has come, has come. The time of the fulfillment 
of all the types and shadows has come. The time of what the law was testifying of and driving us to has come. The time of what the prophets have been talking about, sharing generation after generation, the thing that they had been waiting for, the thing that was demonstrated in types and shadows is here. It's here right now, especially the acceptable year of the Lord. It was the acceptable year of the Lord, the year of Jubilee that made everything that he said before that possible. It was the Jubilee where the captives were set free. It was the Jubilee where those indebted were were released of their dead. It was the Jubilee where they saw supernatural surpluses and a time of absolute cut a rug for Jesus. And Jubilee is a time where we're just not real reserved. Uh, I'm not saying we should be even reserved in every service, but there's a lot that goes on in church culture and there's a lot of things that have to be accomplished. And especially in a setting that we're in, we, we have a lot that we have to try to get done in a short amount of time. And yet Jubilee though is a sanctified time. It's a set apart time where we understand what the Jubilee and the fulfillment of Jubilee is. And we absolutely are gonna cut a rug for Jesus. We're absolutely gonna be no holes barred. If you don't like loud, and I don't care for loud myself, but it's hard to control the band during that week. (laughs) You might wanna go online. If you don't like demonstrations of excitement and people really being touched with a joy and a revelation of how blessed we really are, and then we get to, we get to celebrate it, truly celebrate it for a whole week, it may not be for you. Jubilee is not for everybody because you can't be a prune and come to Jubilee. You, you can't be a Pharisee and come to Jubilee. Other services come, we'll try to reason with you, but not at Jubilee. It's not a time of legalism and, and nitpicking and a bunch of monkeys picking fleas off of each other. It's a time of celebration. It's a time of thanksgiving. It's a time of teaching the young people how to be thankful and to remember the Lord your God. Remember his works. Remember his ways. Remember his exploits. Remember his miracles. In Joshua's day, after Joshua and that generation died, saints, it only took one generation for an entire generation not to know the ways of the Lord and the works of the Lord, and they did evil in the sight of the Lord. We can't, we can't even hardly judge all these young people today that are doing evil in the sight of the Lord. They don't know the ways of the Lord. They don't know the works of the Lord. They don't know the reality of the presence of God. They've not had an encounter with God. They don't know what an altar experience is. And if you don't at least nod your head soon, I'm gonna preach hallelujah. Because we gotta get after it in the sense of modeling even to the young people that what we've experienced is not religion, it's a relationship with the true and the living God in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ by the agency of the Holy Spirit, hallelujah. And so that's what, that's what Jubilee is. Go to Matthew 5. Jesus said something about the law here that I think it's important that we lay a foundation at least on the law and the prophets and the Old Testament types and shadows. We could spend a series on Matthew 5 here and the law and the types and shadows. That's not my purpose today. I just want to make a couple of points and tie it into Jubilee in the sense of types and shadows and, and, and things of that nature. And so Jesus makes this profound statement in Matthew chapter five, look at verse 17. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass away from the law till all is fulfilled. So 
Jesus didn't come to destroy the law. Thank, thank, thank God that he didn't come to wipe it out. He didn't, he didn't come to destroy it. There's a reason why you have a Bible still with an old covenant and a new covenant. And while we're not under the law and the administration of the law and the wrath of God and punishment of God and curses associated with disobeying the law, how many of you know we're not lawless? How many of you know God is writing the law on the tablets of your heart? And that the author and subject of the Bible lives in you now. And now the short version, I'm, I'm just a country boy. I'm just a, a hick. I'm trying not to be a redneck still. <laughs> I'm a simple person and God makes things simple for me. And I, I help simple people. But I used to wonder how in the world is God on my little bitty heart? I have a very small heart. How's he, how's he going to write the first five books of the Bible and all the prophets and the Psalms and the, and the Lord, the Lord is great. It's like, I heard him just so gently say, Dwayne, it's just one word, love. The law is shed abroad in my heart. The love of God is shed abroad in my heart now by the Holy Spirit. So I now can go back and look at the law and glean from the law in all the types and shadows, especially that point to Jesus. He didn't come to destroy it. He came to fulfill it. I am so thankful that I have the law today because one of the purposes of the law is to reveal sin. Can you imagine how corrupt society would be if we didn't have the law that defines sin? Look at how confused people are today and we have the law and they don't know what sin is. God's not gonna destroy that, he didn't destroy that. No, we need that because people, if they don't see their sin, they can't be saved. The beginning of being saved is to know you're lost. And the law shows you how helpless you are, how hopeless you are without God, and it drives you to faith. But once faith has come, it has to be taken away in the sense of it served its, its, primary, its primary purpose. The law has all these types and shadows in it that even help me understand and appreciate even who Jesus is that fulfilled it. Now, we could spend hours on how did Jesus fulfill the law? One of the major ways, and there's many ways, like I said, you could spend hours on this. How did he fulfill the law? Well, one of the major ways is by keeping it. He's the only one that in human form has ever kept it. And he kept it. And, and everything it said he, Messiah, would be, he was. Everything it said where he would be, he showed up, everything it said, he said he would say, he said, everything it said under the law he would do, he did. Well, y'all don't get excited about that. I just think that's just awesome that every, I mean, he fulfilled it, meaning Messiah will be here on this specific date. There'll be a donkey tied up and he shows up at the right spot fulfilling it, saying there's the donkey. Anyway, I'm, I'm going fast. He fulfilled it in the sense of he brought substance, reality to the types and the shadows. He's the antitype of all the, the types. Uh, I, I, I love, I used to be tormented by all this stuff and now I just love it more and more as, as, you, as you realize Jesus fulfilled it. I mean, I used to get so confused. I was brought up in churches that were so under the law, I did learn a lot about the law, but was confused and tormented. And I mean, under the law, you couldn't, you couldn't sow in your field, mix seeds. And my attitude was, what's the big deal? Uh, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't plow your fields with a, a clean animal and an unclean animal, an oxen and a donkey. You couldn't, you couldn't mix wool and linen. Everybody in the 70s would have died wearing double dent suits <laughs> under the law. You not only couldn't eat a pig, you couldn't, you couldn't touch a pig's skin. You couldn't play football. Now you could probably play soccer except being the goalie. 
That'll hit those overseas, I guess. How many of you know Jesus brought substance to all that? And how many of you know under the new covenant now, you can't mix faith and unbelief, faith and unbelief, faith and unbelief. Jesus taught us we better believe only. Don't be trying to live your life and sowing seeds of faith and unbelief together. It won't work. Light and dark won't work together. They won't plow together. Amen. He brought substance. All those lambs by the millions killed for their sins. I am the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. I can look at those types now and appreciate even more the lamb that shed his blood one time for sins forever for us all. Hallelujah. The manna that came down from heaven and sustained them in a foreign land, the desert. Jesus says, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. Your fathers ate that stuff and died in the wilderness. But if you'll eat my flesh and drink my blood, you'll live forever. Hallelujah. See that temple? Tear it down and in three days, I'll raise it up. How can he do that? It took us 48 years to build this temple. But this spake he of his body. Are you listening? You can go on and on and on. And the Jubilee was no different. That was my point. I just wanted to make one point. Aren't you glad that you're not under all the curses of the law and all the punishment for disobeying it? At least get that straight, Galatians 3.13. Because I run into people everywhere that'll read the old covenant and still think God's the one punishing us and cursing us and making us poor and making us sick and all these other things. Jesus came and fulfilled that. What does that mean? He didn't destroy it. He fulfilled it. It means he didn't just die for my sins. He bore the curse of the law for all my sins. That's powerful in your life, your everyday life. So the Jubilee, what was the Jubilee? And here we have Jesus in his first, I think, publicly recorded message. In Nazareth, Nazareth, and and he's saying, This is the acceptable year of the Lord. This is the Jubilee. This is the Sabbath of all Sabbaths. I'll just say it because I get excited. I don't know about y'all. You're a little slow sometimes, but <laughs> I don't mean that mean. You're worth waiting on. Don't misunderstand me. I just get I just get excited ahead of myself. How can you be excited ahead of me? You're not even excited with me, but you do catch up is my point. (laughs) So I just get excited about thinking about what Jesus is saying is, I am the Sabbath of all Sabbaths. I am the Sabbath on steroids. I am the eternal Jubilee. Hallelujah. Man, if you, oh yeah, you, I, I pulled that out of you. I I skillfully pulled that out of you. When you look at the simplicity of the Jubilee, then hopefully Jesus should mean more to to you. See, why, why do some people not have a runaway like I do over grace? Let's just cut to the chase here quickly. Why don't they get excited about grace? Why don't they crave grace? They've never been under law. They don't know the bondage of law. They don't know the guilt and condemnation that comes with the law. My my children are raising my grandchildren and they're having to teach them grace and the value of grace. My, my, My children didn't know the bondage of law. So my grandchildren have no idea. I'll tell stories and they'll think, what kind of world did we live in? I mean, if you came out of some legalism and crazy stuff, that's a lot of you. No wonder you're here. Hallelujah. It's like (laughs) crazy. I mean, crazy. Sunday's the Sabbath. What? And since it's the Sabbath, we can't eat ice cream. I remember going out with a youth group and we couldn't eat ice cream on Sunday. Because Sunday is supposedly now the Sabbath. Crazy stuff. 
So why don't more people, now listen, why don't more people really get excited about Jesus? Why, why, why do I get excited about Jesus just constantly? Is it my personality? Is it, what is it? It's because I know who the man is. Amen. It's because I know what the man did. It's because I know my life is so radically changed and changing. And so a lot of people, because they don't know the types and shadows, they don't know the bondage associated even with the old covenant law, they don't appreciate the freedom we have. They don't appreciate just celebrating Jesus for a week. Amen. It's like, that's what? Y'all gonna celebrate Jesus for a whole week? You're just gonna take a week and celebrate Jesus? Yeah, yeah, what's wrong with you? You know, it's like they think I'm weird. And how many of you know they are weird? So let me quickly, out of Leviticus 25, Leviticus is one of the hardest books in the Bible for me, or it used to be. And I used to be confused. Why does anybody take sleeping pills? Just read the book of Leviticus. You'll be knocked out in 10 minutes. And so I had a hard time getting through Leviticus in my Bible reading and everything. And so chapter 25, though, <laughs> of Leviticus kind of overviews the Jubilee. And so I'm only going to look at a few verses because of time constraints. But we need to at least understand what was the Jubilee in simplicity. And what did Jesus mean when he said... This is the acceptable year of the Lord. The acceptable year of the Lord, the Jubilee, is now. Amen. Even if they didn't get the revelation of it, I guarantee you he got their attention. Because they knew every 50 years, Jubilee was the 50th year. Every 50th year, there was this thing called the Jubilee. Now, before we even read it, I think it would help us to understand the Sabbath rest that was practiced under the law of resting the land. So they would work for six years, just like you work six days, and on the seventh day, you rest. I've got a new book coming out, Rhythms of Grace, and I've got a whole chapter on the Sabbath and the rest and the purpose of that and, and, the, and the, the physical and spiritual uh, resetting of, of your body, that you work six days and now you need to rest even physically your body and, and it recover. And so every six days you work, rest on the seventh, seventh, then the land had to rest. And I believe even in the natural the land needs to rest to recuperate from yielding its fruit. And there's something spiritual about the ground. That's personal. I have another book coming out on seeds and I deal with the ground, the ground and the holiness of the ground, the power of the ground, the connection of Israel's prosperity to the land and our connection to our prosperity in the ground, the ground of your heart. And so every six years you sowed and in the seventh year you had to rest the land. You couldn't work the land. But what would happen is on the sixth year, the land would produce a bumper crop, enough surplus for you to live for a whole year not having to sow and reap. Does that make sense? In simplicity, you, you work the land, first, second, third, fourth, all the way to six years, and you get enough fruit surplus to live that year, to prosper that year, to trade, to feed your family, and for commerce, for trade. Then on the sixth year, you get, if you got 50 bushels of something for six straight years, in the sixth year, you would get a hundred bushels. Got it? Then there was seven times seven. 
So in the 49th year, that was the Sabbath of Sabbaths. Seven years, seven years, 14, seven years, 21, seven years, 28. Don't push my math. (laughs) I hadn't thought this out. But do you get the pattern? Eventually you come to the 49th year and that is the Sabbath of Sabbaths on resting the land. And listen, Leviticus 25 verse 21 says, The land gave in the 49th year three times its yield so you could survive and thrive in the 49th year, survive and thrive in the 50th year, the year of Jubilee, and then survive and thrive in the 51st year because you had to start over with sowing again and it took time to reap. Everybody okay so far? Real simple. Let's read it in Leviticus 25. What happened in that 50th year? Leviticus 25, verse 8. Leviticus 25, verse 8. And again, this whole chapter deals with the Jubilee, and we just don't have time to do the whole thing. And you shall count... Seven Sabbaths of years for yourself, seven times seven years. And the time of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be to you 49 years. Then you shall cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the 10th day of the seventh day of the month, the day of atonement. I love that. The day that Israel celebrated the forgiveness of the sins of the whole nation, the day of atonement, you you sound the trumpet. You shall make the trumpet to sound throughout all your land and you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to how many inhabitants? All the inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you And each of you shall return to his possession. That's the land that Joshua divvied out to all the tribes. And each of you shall return to his family. That 50th year shall be a jubilee to you. You shall neither sow nor reap what grows of its own accord, nor gather the grapes of your untended vine. For it is the jubilee it shall be holy to you. You shall eat its produce from the land. Now, personally, I struggled a little bit. When you go to reading all this on your own, it's going to keep saying you don't eat of the land for those, those, three, those three years. You don't eat of anything that you sow because you don't, and you're not allowed to sow. And then other things just grow naturally and you're not supposed to eat that. But then in verse 21, it explains it. You're eating of the surplus of the 49th year. So let's go back and see what were the four things in simplicity, four things in simplicity. Number one, you're to proclaim liberty to all its inhabitants. You're to go throughout the whole land and tell everyone this is the year to celebrate freedom, freedom, liberty, freedom. Number two, Each of you return to your possession. That is the land that Joshua gave out to every tribe. Every 50th year, your land, your promised land that flows with milk and honey, your promised land that is connected to your prosperity, your promised land that is your possession. Notice he didn't say you returned all your possessions. It's your possession. What was their possession? What was the promise that God made Abraham? The land. What was the promise that Joshua fulfilled as a type of Jesus? The land and you getting your own land. And anything can happen in 50 years. And no matter what happens over 50 years, 
You find yourself poor and you have to sell your land. You were a poor steward and you lost your land. Every 50 years, your land came back to you, hallelujah. Man, I'm telling you, even in the natural, I would have shouted hallelujah, that at least in one lifetime, I'm gonna prosper. On the, when will I prosper at least once? Every 50 years, everybody prospers. Everybody is blessed. It will be the year of Jubilee when you get back your land, your land that was promised to Abraham, that God promised to Israel, and that Joshua gave out. Man, I want to preach the substance of it. Let's, let's get it all laid first. Number three, you return to your families. You return to your families. Indentured servanthood was a part of their culture and a part of, of poor financial management. And many people were enslaved because of debt. And the year of Jubilee is when all debts were canceled and you get to go home to your family. Hallelujah. Man, even in the natural, wouldn't that be exciting? You can read in the old covenant where widows were about to lose their children to debt and to creditors. Amen. Amen. Many people lost their children because of poor financial stewardship or poverty, generational poverty coming on them and all kinds of issues when it comes to finances. And during the year of Jubilee, the slaves, the servants were released back to their families. Man, that's exciting. And then number four, you will eat of the surplus of the 49th year. You'll have three years of miraculous provisions. Hallelujah. How many of you know in the new covenant, we are supposed to go into all the world and proclaim liberty. Hallelujah. It's not for a select elect. It's not for a few. We are to go into all the world in Jesus name as a perpetual year of Jubilee and proclaim to everybody everywhere, you are free. You've been made free. You don't have to be enslaved to drugs anymore. You don't have to be enslaved to perversion anymore. You don't have to be enslaved to an addiction of, of, of drugs or alcohol or digital addiction or any kind of addiction. Jesus has come and he is the Jubilee and we can have right now, right now, right now, freedom in this world over anything that the enemy enslaves people with. We are supposed to proclaim this every Sunday morning. Amen. We start the week off with proclaiming Jesus is Lord, hallelujah. And Jesus is here and we can have right now by faith anything God has ever promised humanity. We don't have to wait till we die to get in the, into the great by and by to experience healing and prosperity and relational functionality. That'll hit some of you later. <laughs> we don't have to put anything off anymore. They, they, had to, they had to put a lot of stuff off, but in the 50th year, you go throughout the whole land and you tell everybody liberty has come. Freedom has come. We're gonna celebrate for a whole year, the whole nation, freedom. As the church, we must be a habitual, continual witness of jubilee in the sense of we have been set free and whom the son sets free is free indeed. Amen. It has to be proclaimed. It has to be proclaimed. It doesn't matter what happens in the world and how things look in the world. We're in the eternal jubilee and we are to proclaim freedom throughout the world. Number two, we have now our possession. How many of you know we've come into our land? If you don't know it, you've been brought back to the land. And guess what our land is? The kingdom of God. We have been translated. Colossians 1.13 says, we have been delivered from the powers of darkness and translated into the land. Translated into our promised land. Translated into a land that flows with milk and honey. Translated into a land that still has giants. It's called the kingdom of God. And that land suffers violence. But the violent take it by force. Hallelujah. And we can drive out all the enemies of the land. 
With much tribulation, Paul says, you'll enter the kingdom of God. Jesus said, do not fear, little flock. It's your father's good pleasure to give you your possession, give you your inheritance, give you your land. And that land flows with milk and honey. It's called the kingdom of God. Man, I live in the land. I live in an eternal, perpetual jubilee where I live in my promised land. Hallelujah. And that, in that land, I have an armor. In that land, I can overcome any giant. In that land, I have a new name. In that land, I have an armor. In that land, I have a sword. In that land, all things are possible to me because of my possession, the promised land. How many people, Christians, live their whole life thinking God cheated us somehow? God has not cheated you, brothers and sisters. You may not understand it. You may not be functional in it. But you have your promised land, the kingdom of God. Number three, they were to re be returned to their families. All debts canceled. How many of you know we're no longer slaves to the family of man? We are no longer slaves to the family of man. We are no longer in Adam. We are no longer in bondage and slavery to an old man in Adam. We've been translated into a new man, a new family, the family of God. When Paul was praying in Ephesians chapter three, verse 15, he mentions the family of God in heaven and the family of God in the earth. You're a part of a family now. You've come home. And one of the messages we have to proclaim throughout the land is God's people need to come home. God's people need to come home. Quit participating in the activities of the family of man. You're no longer a member of the family of man. You're no longer in Adam, but now you are in a new, new family, the family of God. How many of you know you're either in the family of God or you're in the Adam's family? <laughs> Anybody remember that show? You know what's odd about the Adams family? Listen, they thought everybody else was weird. The family of man is blinded. The family of man thinks sin is normal. Thinks those that have been called out are the strange ones. But the good news is you're no longer without a family. You're no longer without an identity. You're no longer an orphan. You're no longer an indentured servant Amen. to the family of man. But now you're servants and friends of God. Hallelujah. Amen. That's what Jubilee is. That's what Jesus was saying is that I'm going as your Jubilee to make a new family identification possible for the whole world. And number four, oh man, I love it. There was a commanded blessing on the harvest of the 49th year. And how many of you know that we have a commanded blessing on us called grace? Hallelujah. Ephesians 1, 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath, past tense, blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. Saints, we can live a supernatural life. We have a supernatural surplus in grace. Everything that pertains to life and godliness has been uh, made available to us through the knowledge of God and his son, Jesus Christ now. The knowledge of his amazing grace. We've got more than enough for our families You've got more than enough for your individual life. Let me start, let me start where it all started with me. I, I, I received in an open vision in 1980 more than enough to supply me that it's like I entered some jubilee. I entered some understanding and revelation of Jesus and who he is to me personally that it doesn't matter what it feels like. I'm not minimizing feelings. They're a part of life, but they don't rule us. They don't control us. They're not the source of our faith. Amen. 
regardless of my feelings, regardless of my sight and what I see, there's a grace, a surplus, a commanded blessing. We're not only individually blessed, when we dwell together in unity, there's a commanded blessing on us. This is why we strive for our church culture. We strive to work together, to walk things out, to dwell together in the unity of the spirit, in the bond of peace, until we come to the unity of the faith. We, we don't see everything eye to eye. Sue and I don't see everything eye to eye. It's, it's one of the reasons I'm still married is she's going to come around. <laughs> I refuse to give up. <laughs> but there's a unity of the spirit. Ephesians 4 verses 1 through 3. A unity of the spirit. Common vision. Common understanding of the goodness of God. In which God commands a blessing. We live under, whether we understand it or not, a commanded blessing. We don't have to obtain it. If you look at Ephesians chapter 4, it says that you endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Endeavor to keep it. We already have it. In Jesus, our jubilee, we just have to maintain it. And that's what good church culture does is we're going to live. If you want to fuss and fight, go somewhere else. Amen. That could come across wrong. I'm not trying to run anybody off. Just certain people. <laughs> people just want to fuss and fight. Life's too short. I'm in my jubilee. I'm living in a jubilee. And you want to argue over that? I don't mind a healthy debate or disagreement or, or conversation, but fuss, fight, fall out. How do, you, how do you reconcile that with Jubilee? I can't reconcile that with Jubilee. I, I'm in an eternal, perpetual Jubilee with Jesus. And I just want to meet with a, a bunch of other people that love Jesus, hallelujah. And let's, let's Let's celebrate Jubilee together, hallelujah. Let's celebrate our forgiveness. Let's celebrate our healings. Let's celebrate our marriages being functional. I, I'm working on things behind the scenes that's just amazing in my own personal life, but seeing where God wants to take his people and where we're not. And then how do we get us to where we need to be? How many of you know God? God wants us to be celebrating marriage and you don't hear anything about marriage anymore except the negative now. Our children. You know, I, was, I gave you the announcement and it still excites me. A 4,000 square foot playground. I'm talking big time playground in the church under a roof. And it's like kids having fun. Kids need to have fun. And they, they need to be introduced to Jesus early. Amen. It's important. Church in a community and for a city, not in a city, is important to reach children. I was ministering on faith just recently. And I said some things by the Spirit and just inspirationally that I had said decades ago that I'd forgot that as I was saying it, it was just, it was blessing me and remembering of why, why do we need to protect our children with vigilance? Because God created every one of us to believe. When you were little, you believed your divine design was faith. God created you to believe. You have to be taught unbelief. You believed animals talked. You believed an overweight. 
I don't have time to be nice. A fat man in a red suit came down a little bitty chimney and left presents. That he had these reindeer. I guarantee you, I knew the Santa Claus thing was not true because if something lands on my roof with reindeer, how many of you know my rifle's coming out and we're fixing to have venison? <laughs> you bet he's a gift giver. And I believe I received mine. Bam! <laughs> Clean that deer, baby. <laughs> you believed rabbits had eggs. Are you getting my point? You had to be taught unbelief. And we have to protect their moral and faith innocence. Of course, an eight-year-old might be able to be told he's something he's not and believe it. This is why we have to tell them who they are early in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Man, I don't know about you. But I am celebrating personally. I pray we celebrate corporately that we have entered the Sabbath of Sabbaths. His name is Jesus. And we have entered a perpetual jubilee. His name is Jesus. Amen and amen. Somebody give him praise. Hallelujah. (laughs) Hallelujah. Jesus, we do celebrate you. And we do sanctify times. The feast were times of celebrating. And while we're not under any of those, we see the fulfillment in Jesus. And we too do not want to get stuck in just waiting on something to come. We do have a hope of the resurrection that burns in our hearts. We do have a hope of seeing you face to face. We do have things to come to put hope in. But today we mix faith in what has come, what is now. Thank you, Jesus, for bringing substance to every type and shadow, for fulfilling that law and the prophets and the prophets. Help us to see it, help us to appreciate it, and help us to celebrate it. In your name I pray, amen and amen.